from the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee, I'm Charles Brussel. This is The Log. Well, first things first here, the most important uh, news item on my docket. There's a Food Network video that's gone viral in recent days, and I'm here to set the record straight. <laughs> the Midwest is famous for the casserole. And there's two varieties. There's the hot casserole and the cold. The cold ones are, are more commonly known as salads. And you can use just about anything in a salad, any kind of fruit, vegetable. It's usually tied together with mayonnaise. I like to uh, put in a little uh, lemon juice into mine when I make my famous uh, tuna pasta salad. Well, uh, a chef named Molly Ye, or Yi, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Y-E-H, has created what she calls an iconic Midwestern dish. Calls for snap peas, shallots, carrots, and celery with a mayonnaise dressing. Yeah, that does sound like a classic Midwestern dish. Sounds like I'd like it. Normally what you do is you toss in some cold pasta, whatever variety you like. I like the little twisty ones. But no, <laughs> to everyone's absolute shock and horror, She's putting this thing together and then folds in a big old bowl of, wait for it, popcorn. So she's, in this video, she's sloshing around popcorn in mayonnaise with these uh, nice fresh vegetables. And it is frightening. And she claims it's a classic Midwestern dish. And I'm here to tell you, as a lifelong Midwesterner, and I've checked in with a lot of my friends, nobody, nobody has ever heard of this thing. It's the big lie. Don't you believe it for a second. She seasons the popcorn salad with some white cheddar powder, which she calls magic cheesy dust. That actually sounds pretty Midwestern. I don't know if I have any problem with that. As she whips up the dish, by the way, I'm reading from Newsweek right now. She says, popcorn salad is one of those classic Midwestern dishes that you would often find in a church basement potluck. And it's typically made of veggies, popcorn, and mayonnaise. I know some people who put fish in theirs, and you think it's not going to work. And then you taste it, and it's really good. Nope. Nope, this is not a thing. This is absolutely not a thing. Don't do it. Don't ever do it. And if you see this viral video, please know that all of us Midwesterners are collectively calling her out. She's making it up. It's not a thing. The texture of the popcorn in the salad is so weirdly good. I just can't get enough of it. See, it looks like you're going to get a salad, but you look underneath and you see a pile of popcorn. That's my kind of salad. No, 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 no. You do realize that, the, that within the first few minutes, that popcorn is going to get soggy, right? This is just wrong on a hundred different levels. And mostly because she's trying to advance this horrible, horrible lie. I mean, we have enough troubles being from the Midwest. Oh, my God. People from Wisconsin? I know. I've lived on both coasts. I've lived in New York. I've lived in California. <laughs> People don't like us. They already think badly of us. This is not helping. <laughs> Thousands of people watched and commented on the video, and it later went viral after being shared on Twitter with people unsure of how they felt about the unusual food pairing. Commenting on the recipe, Cassie Marie asked, Am I the only one who has lived their entire life in the Midwest and have never seen a popcorn salad? I guess I shouldn't knock it until I try it, but is this an actual staple recipe? And from where? Well, I've been <laughs> commiserating with my friends from Wisconsin and Minnesota, which are the undisputed champions of the Midwestern cold salad. And this is not, this, no, this is, this is wrong. 
Aaron Long Mozzie joked, she has to hide the popcorn with watercress because she can't even fathom what she just made. Sheila Garner Allen added, I love your food, comedy, popcorn salad. I guess this pandemic brought out a lot of creativity. Facebooker Jennifer Lynn commented, that's it. Take away her food handler's card. Anyone making this monstrosity is not ready for the responsibility of preparing real food or making sure it's safe for human consumption. <laughs> Yeah, I'm here to tell you, I've never heard of it. Not one of my Midwestern friends, and I have plenty of them in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and we've been talking about it. Not one of them has heard of this. Don't believe it for a second. Molly Ye's popcorn salad. Nope, not a thing. It's some horrible joke. Let's see, was it first posted on April 1st, maybe? Is that the reason this is? Uh, it doesn't say when it was originally posted. Maybe that's it. Maybe it was originally posted on April Fool's Day. All right. Well, had to lead with that story. The most important story of the day. Uh, hey, did you hear about this watchdog report regarding uh, January 6th? Yeah, it's pretty damning. Reading now from Democracy Now!, a new report by the Capitol Police's watchdog reveals officials knew Congress was the target of the deadly January 6th insurrection, yet officers were instructed to refrain from deploying a more aggressive response. Yeah, their hands were tied by official policy. And of course, uh, we've heard in pretty good detail about how the highest officials in the military, in the National Guard, and going right up to the White House and to the Orange Menace himself, were slow rolling the response intentionally. And then, of course, once it got started, we all know what happened. The Orange Menace watched with glee from the White House and tweeted out his encouragement to the, uh, well, we all, we know the whole story. All right. All right. Well, speaking of Congress, God, the House of Representatives, there is nothing more fascinating than the current House of Representatives. The 117th Congress, just every day, there's something new to cheer them on about. Now, of course, you know, I, I definitely don't want to get back into it because you and I have talked about it till I'm blue and I'm tired of Joe Manchin and I'm tired of reconciliation and the filibuster. And I know the challenges. I know that the illegitimate Republican Party is going to just stop anything in its tracks just because that's what they do. I know, I know, I know. But just isolating for the moment the actual work, the actual legislation that the House of Representatives is writing and in some cases passing. They haven't passed this one yet, but, uh, but they're working on it. And right now I'm talking about reparations. AP story, House panel poised to advance bill on slavery reparations. A House panel is expected to advance a decades-long effort to pay reparations to the descendants of slaves with a vote Wednesday, so that was yesterday. It would create a commission to study the issue. Okay, okay, it's just a commission, it's just a study, but still, the fact that the House of Representatives and the United States Congress is even drafting this kind of legislation is just, I don't know, I, don't know, I can't help it, it's just exciting to me. The prospects of passage are probably nil, but as I've said many times, it's not a reason for the House to do nothing. Just because the Senate is broken beyond repair, at least for the moment, is not a reason for the House to sit on its hands and do nothing. And apparently Nancy Pelosi agrees. Good for her. So they are writing legislation, or at least in this case, commissioning a study. And if and when we can repair the broken Senate, then, uh, you know, maybe we got something here. But I, I just love it that the House is doing things like this. They're writing big, bold bills on everything from climate, jobs, health care. And now, believe it or not, reparations. The legislation would establish a 13-member commission to examine slavery and discrimination in the United States from 1619 to the present. The commission would then recommend ways to educate Americans about its findings and appropriate remedies, including how the government would offer a formal apology and what form of compensation should be awarded. Now, I'm the very first person to say I don't know what those details are. I don't know. 
Uh, I, I know plenty of people have written about it. I know Tennessee Coates has some uh, pretty good ideas. Uh, I, in the moment, I don't remember what they were. <laughs> I remember reading it a couple of years ago. But And this goes back to another uh, just universal truth that I, I keep sharing. What keeps me optimistic as an American, and it's harder every day to be optimistic because of the, of the deeply flawed leadership, but I keep coming back to the fact that there are there are so many brilliant, beautiful people with wonderful, great ideas on every issue that faces us. They're out there. They just have to be unleashed. They have to be called upon. Let me read a little more from this AP article. Uh, by passing H.R. 40, Congress can also start a movement toward the national reckoning we need to bridge racial divides, said Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, Democrat Texas. And the bill's sponsor... The House bill has 176 co-sponsors, zero Republicans among them. Members of the Congressional Black Caucus brought up the bill during a recent meeting with Joe Biden. We're very comfortable with where President Biden is on H.R. 40, Jackson Lee told reporters after the meeting. The goal here is restoration. Where would we be as a people if it were not for 246 years of stolen labor and accompanying horrors if not for the multiple periods of multi-billion dollar plunder post-enslavement. We must be made whole. That's Cam Howard, co-chair of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. So good for the House. Good for them. It's not a dance in the streets kind of victory. It's a, a, an opening bid. But at least they're moving. They're continuing the fight. They're making some progress. And again, as, as broken as Washington is, it's really great to see House Democrats tackling serious issues and doing it seriously. It's not grandstanding. It's not ideology. It's not showboating. It's a real effort to tackle real issues. And my God, what bigger issue is there in this land than the legacy of the African-American, the legacy of slavery, and the absolute moral responsibility for both a formal apology and meaningful reparations. Again, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but there are smarter people than me, believe me. Everybody's smarter than I am. And we have, we have some excellent proposals out there. So good for you. Good for you, House Democrats. All right. What else caught my eye this week? You know, you and I talked at length about the whole um, uh, corporate America and its response to the anti-voter law in Georgia. Well, since you and I spoke, it's accelerated quite a lot. You've probably heard some of these headlines. Uh, over last weekend, 100 corporate leaders got together via this big Zoom meeting to discuss how they should respond. And they came out pretty much in agreement that they weren't going to pussyfoot around. And they eventually released a statement together, joint statement, that, uh, yeah, they're not having it. They're absolutely, <laughs> I mean, it sounds silly. I'm not really going out on a limb here, but in support of democracy. Of course, in this very weird, bizarro land we're living in now, to say you're in support of democracy puts you in the Republicans' doghouse. Now, I'm, I'm kind of quick to not get too excited about this. It's all, as far as I'm concerned, it's all PR. They're doing it because they feel they have no choice. If the opposite side was better for their bottom line, you can bet that's where they'd be. I'm not cynical. I'm just a realist. I think, I, I don't know, you agree with that, don't you? If it was in their financial interest to fully support Georgia and their anti-voter law, well, they would. They only act in their financial interest. It's all about the bottom line. And it just so happens in this case, their bottom line aligns with our best interests. That's not always the case. In fact, it's very rarely the case. But this time it is. So these corporate leaders, they step up to the plate. Let's see. Have I got that? Uh, did I save their um, statement here? Let's see. Well, here's a quote. Voting is the lifeblood of our democracy, 
and we call upon all Americans to join us in taking a nonpartisan stand for this most basic and fundamental right of all Americans. We all should feel a responsibility to defend the right to vote and oppose any discriminatory legislation or measures that restrict or prevent any eligible voter from having an equal and fair opportunity to cast a ballot. <laughs> Yeah, that's not really very fiery, controversial language, isn't it? Is it? You wouldn't think Republicans would be upset by that. <laughs> How have we come to a point where they find that offensive? Many of the signers have been loyal donors to Republican political campaigns, according to the AP story I'm looking at right now. And now here's where, here's where I get a little bit cynical. Like I say, it's really about PR. If they really mean it, what they'll do is they'll divest. And you and I have talked about that. They will divest from the Republican Party. Reading again here. After a mob of Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol on Jan 6 to stop Congress from certifying Joe Biden's win over Trump, many companies said they would stop contributing to lawmakers who voted to reject the outcome of the election or pause all giving to review their donation policies. The freeze has begun to thaw. A political action committee controlled by AT&T, which pledged to cut off lawmakers who objected to certifying the election, cut a $5,000 check in February to House Conservatives Fund, a leadership PAC led by Indiana Rep. Jim Banks, who voted to object to the election results. JetBlue Airways, which said it would pause donations after January 6th and signed the letter, recently gave $1,000 to New York Republican Representative Nicole Maliotakis, who also voted to object to the election outcome. Some are donating to committees controlled by party leaders that spend big to boost the chances of all Republican candidates in the House and the Senate. Most companies have not said whether they will withhold donations from lawmakers who are pushing the new voting laws. So <laughs> Major League Baseball pulls out of Atlanta and moves the game to Coors Field, in Denver, but that's the only tangible thing that's happened. And they certainly, I don't know if it cost them anything. I don't, probably not. Yeah. Have a zoom meeting, get some good PR, get somebody to write a really nice statement for you, sign your name to it, but then you continue to contribute to the Republicans, man, what is, you know, come on, we can't fall for this PR stuff. We have to continue to demand real and tangible action from these corporations that makes a difference, and that is divestment. Do you really care as a so-called corporate citizen, a, a phrase I can't stand? If you're somebody who really believes there is such thing as a good corporate citizen, that you do have some responsibility to the country where you operate? See, I think it's all just PR, but if you actually believe that, well, then prove it's not PR and bleed the Republican Party dry. You have the power to do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, they got a lot of small donors. They really do, especially with the Orange Menace working his little grift magic. But you don't think your big corporate dollars make a difference to the Republican Party and their re-election chances? Cut them off. Withhold. Divest. If you really mean it, yeah, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it until I see actual divestment. Oh, another big headline from, uh, was it just yesterday? The war in Afghanistan. Okay, Joe says, now, we're going to miss that May 1st deadline for withdrawal that uh, the Orange Menace promised. So the Taliban is pretty unhappy about that. Uh, but he did announce and made the big news this week that all American troops would be out of Afghanistan by September 11th, the 20th anniversary of the attack. So this war, coming up on its 20th anniversary of the invasion, will be over for the Americans. Complete withdrawal. That's what Joe says. So we can join the Soviet Union as a couple of nations who have lost wars in Afghanistan. There's no peace with honor. There's no uh, whatever you want to call it, however you want to dress it up, in your Orwellian governmental linguistics. This is just chalk this one up as a loss. On the big old scorecard, America has now lost uh, its last few wars. It's been quite a while since America won a war. Um, when was the last war that America won? I guess you'd have to go back to World War II. 
Korea, a draw at best. <laughs> I wouldn't even say that. Certainly didn't win Vietnam. That was just a hard loss. You can't call it anything else but. None of the so-called forever wars here, Iraq, Syria, <laughs> you couldn't call any of these a win. They're all dismal, embarrassing losses. I mean, not to get too overarchingly broad here, but the very concept of war is so outdated. It's just kind of comically ridiculous that we can even think that a conventional war should or could be fought and won. We're just, we're just past that. But that's, that's for another day. For our immediate news headline here, yeah, Afghanistan. So what that leaves is the Afghanistan government in conflict with the Taliban. And it's a pretty easy prediction for everybody to say that when the U.S. is gone, the Taliban will take full control, just a matter of time. They already control, I don't know, half the country, more. And then, of course, there's al-Qaeda. And the Taliban has told the world, I'm sorry for laughing, that they won't allow al-Qaeda to uh, regain any sort of foothold. But of course they will. I mean, I'm not an expert. I, I, don't, I don't pretend to be an expert in any of these things. But listen to the debates. Read the articles on this. Read the experts. There's a lot of different opinions. But one of those very strong opinions is that the Taliban will be in control of Afghanistan once again, just like when we uh, invaded 20 years ago. Despite their promises, the Taliban will allow or at least fail in uh, resisting the resurgence of al-Qaeda, which currently is weak in Afghanistan. I was just watching the, some experts debate this on uh, NewsHour last night. Yeah, okay, it's true. Al-Qaeda has uh, waning power in Afghanistan, but that, there's nothing to promise that's going to be permanent. Al-Qaeda is quite strong in other areas of the world, so there's no reason to believe they couldn't have a, a, a major resurgence. So after a couple of trillion dollars and uh, how many lives lost, pretty much right back where we started, that's a loss. Chalk it up. There's another L in the loss column. War is just so stupid. <laughs> it's just, it's so damn dumb. It's, it's no longer a viable course. It's just futile. The post 9-11 war making in Iraq in Afghanistan, toss in Yemen and Syria, toss in the Cold War with Iran. There's got to be a better way. 20 years of this. What a pathetic stretch of history this has been. The death, the destruction, millions of lives, children who've grown up to be adults living their entire lives in a state of war, knowing nothing else. And now Joe Biden's proposed military budget is a, what, $743 billion? I think I read it's a 13% increase from the last budget. So with all the uh, success that the left wing has been celebrating, able to push Joe to the left on certain issues, and they have, they have, there are areas to be happy about. This isn't one. Of course, it's the toughest nut to crack. It's the most entrenched lobby in all of Washington. It just permeates all of Congress, the House, the Senate. It permeates K Street. It permeates everything in the air in Washington, D.C., and that is military spending, what Dwight Eisenhower famously labeled the military-industrial complex, which is a very apt term and is as alive today as it ever was. So I know it's the, that's the toughest nut to crack. You can't just get a bunch of little lefty uh, representatives together and have a little White House meeting and say, you know, let's cut the military budget in half and put the money to where it's better needed. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know. I'm uh, idealistic, but I'm not stupid. I know that's not easy. No reason to not call for it, though. Let's say it out loud. I'll say it out loud. Yeah, cut the military budget in half. Cut it by three quarters. We don't need it. Take all that money and do the infrastructure you want to do, both the physical infrastructure and the social infrastructure and the human infrastructure. Make sure that every elder in America is taken care of. Make sure that every family has a living wage. 
Make sure that every kid has a loving adult available to them and not imprisoned in a low-wage job that doesn't really add anything to anyone's life. It only continues to turn the wheels of this great capitalist corporate monster we've created. Yeah, those really great, smart, good people I've been talking about that I'm always talking about, I bet they could come up with a lot of good ways to spend $500 billion. Leave the uh, Pentagon a couple hundred billion. Fine. They literally don't need more than that. They absolutely do not need it. It's all a giant pathological sickness. Yeah, man, couldn't believe it when I saw that. Well, I take that back. I could believe it, but I wasn't any less disappointed. An increase in the military budget. And you think, okay, well, <laughs> if it was going to something worthwhile, like a cyber defense, I'll fund that to the hilt. How much do you need? We absolutely have to have cyber defense. We have to protect the grid. We have to protect free access to the Internet. The damage that can be done, not only to individuals and their well-being, but to whole systems, the electrical grid, hospitals, communications. Yeah, <laughs> I'll write a blank check for cybersecurity. Again, I'm idealistic. I'm not stupid. I know there are dangerous actors in the world. I know there has to be defense against them. I know this. But $743 billion for just more of the same tanks and planes and helicopters and all the tools that have become obsolete right before our eyes, but we don't want to admit it. We keep building them. We keep buying them. But uh, at least we're getting out of Afghanistan with our tails between our legs. And... President Joe and everybody else will try to put a happy face on it and talk about all these great achievements we've made. <laughs> they will. So there you go. There's another chapter coming to a close. And the, uh, the terror and carnage we left behind, well, I guess we're just not going to take any responsibility for that. It's a lot easier in the beginning than it is in the end. Once you get all tied up, even presidents with the best intentions will come up against these uh, roadblocks. I guess there's no point anymore in going back to W and Rumsfeld and Cheney and that gang for the horrible, deadly decisions they made way back when. But it would have been much easier at the time to resist these vengeful, xenophobic calls for invasion and war than to try to untangle years later. There was never going to be a happy ending to this. And here we are. We're at the end. So what can we do? What can any of us do when a tragic, horrible mistake has been made except admit the mistake, do whatever is possible to make amends, to make reparations, and see that something so heinous never happens again? Terrible chapter, terrible chapter in American history. Not one single goddamn thing to be proud about in this chapter. All right. Thanks for listening. I love you. I'm Charles Purcell.